All right. Going to get going here. Um, so today we're going to continue on our discussion of microbes associated with humans, um, starting with uh, human microbiome and then talking about pathogens. Uh, if you didn't notice the email, um, there's we're rearranging the schedule a little bit. Uh, rather than going into plants next, we're actually going to do fungi next week, and then go into plants after the fungi. So next week will be three uh, lectures on fungi before moving the week after into plant um, studies, and that's partly to coordinate better with the labs and partly for many other reasons. Um, the Midterm class assignments, you have to go to the correct room here because there will be a test with your name on it waiting for you. Um, so A through SAC and Freeborn and SAN through Z and Chem 179. And again, bring a pen and a number two pencil. The pen is for the short answer questions. Um, and if you, you, you can use a pencil for those, but you won't be allowed to submit anything for regrades if you use a pencil. And also make sure to bring a photo ID. There's going to be a review session uh, Saturday from 11 to um, up until 1 if, it, if people still have questions through then. Um, there's not going to be any, I'm not preparing any material for that. You have to bring questions uh, to ask about topics you did or did not understand. I'm not going to do things like review all of lecture 4. Um, uh, you have to have a specific question about something and I will try and re-explain it to you um, or answer questions like that. Yeah. Yeah, so we will, we will record it. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the timing to upload it, but we'll try to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, since I may be responsible for that, someone may have to re-teach me how to do it. Um, but yeah, we will, we will podcast it. Any other questions about the midterm? Yeah. <laughs> How many questions? Um, I, I don't remember. Uh, less than 50, more than 10. Uh, um, we, we estimate that it, it should not be excess, excessively long. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, any other? Yeah. Um, the material in Monday's lecture will not be on the midterm, but um, there, there will be multiple clicker questions on Monday to encourage you to show up, um, although that's just bonus points, so you guys do whatever you decide to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, today's lecture is on the midterm. And also, many people have asked, I'll, I'll get to your question in one second, many people have asked, we posted, shh. We posted last year's midterm number one. There are topics that we did not cover this year or covered in a slightly different way. If there's something on that midterm that is not material that we covered, you don't have to know it. So for example, we switched from doing phylogenetic analysis with unrooted trees last year to doing it with rooted trees this year. You have to understand how to do it with rooted trees. You don't really have to understand many of the details of unrooted trees. Okay, yeah. Uh, what chapter are these, um, lectures the, the lectures that for human microbiome, uh, chapter 26 mostly, but we're also doing stuff from chapter 27. So there's a section in chapter 26 in version 10 of the book that is explicitly about the human microbiome, a very small section. And then there's a section in chapter 26 that covers the environmental DNA characterization that we talked about in the last lecture. And then today we're going to be talking about a couple of examples from um, chapter 26, and I'll tell you what those are, and then a few examples from 27. Yes. Okay, please. So I'll just repeat if you didn't hear. The chapters of reading covered for the midterm are 22, 26, and 27. And what you have to know from the reading is largely material that relates explicitly to things we talked about in lecture. I tried to reference a lot of the different sections of 22, 26, and 27 in lecture, but there are parts that we did not talk about at all 
Um, you really don't have to, we're going to ask questions based on material that was covered in lecture itself. Okay, so I, I think I may have mentioned this to this section before, but I'm not sure. Uh, if you're interested, I have this project that's been run out of my lab. It's kind of a wacky, crazy project um, called Project Mer Mercury. Um, it involves a collaboration with a group called Science Cheerleaders, who are NFL and NBA cheerleaders who are also scientists and engineers. And they've been going around sampling um, microbes at public events like football, basketball, baseball games. One of the science cheerleaders is a grad student here in biomedical engineering, Wendy Brown. And we just, a few minutes ago, had um, microbes from this project as well as sampling kits launched on a rocket that's going up to the space station to do a research project on microbial diversity in space. And if you want to find out more, you can just look at the hashtag space microbes or go to the website. Um, it's pretty cool to see a rocket going up to the space station with samples from this project. And here, I was sitting outside in between classes watching um, the launch. Uh, the launch has been canceled about 10 times, so it was kind of good to... All right, so what we're going to do is continue on the discussing of microbes associated with humans. Um, the first part will be on continuing on the human microbiome. And then the second part will be focusing largely on uh, pathogens, organisms that cause disease, uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So I know you really wanted me to talk about the do-it-yourself fecal transplant again, but I won't. No, I can't. Um, I did, after I got home from lecture, I was telling my kids about what I talked about in class, and they thought it was cool. Um, so. Uh, so in the previous class, one of the things I suggested a way to think about the human microbiome was to think like an ecologist, because this is a community of microbes that lives on us, and each part of us can be viewed as a different microbial ecosystem. And what I want to do today is take a different approach, which is just to very briefly talk about how to think like an evolutionary biologist in terms of the human microbiome and why that can be useful. So again, if we take the, the human, chimp, gorilla, orangutan tree that I've been using for a lot of the discussion of phylogenetic methods, and we can ask, um, can we look at the evolutionary history of this cloud of microbes that are associated with humans? And one way to do that is to basically do exactly what we've been doing for other features. We can treat the cloud of microbes as a character trait and the relative abundance of particular kinds of microbes as the character state, and then overlay that information onto the phylogenetic tree of primates or of vertebrates, or go beyond that and try and understand what the ancestral character states were, what did our ancestors interact with in terms of their microbial community. And so this is a common approach in studying communities of organisms, there's a lot of different work that's been done on integrating ecology with evolutionary history. So, for example, studying the diversity of plants and animals associated with Gondwana land and ancient uh, movements of the continental plates and so on. And what we're going to talk about just for a few minutes is doing the same thing in principle for the microbial community that's in and on people. And this... Um, figure I thought uh, it would be good to just show real data. This is from a relatively recent paper by a scientist named Ruth Lay and some of her colleagues. And what she did was collect data herself as well as from other people's studies where they had used this approach that we've talked about, isolate DNA from the environment, run ribosomal RNA, PCR, make lots of copies of all the ribosomal RNA genes from those samples, and then read sequences of those ribosomal RNA genes after the PCR, assign those individual ribosomal RNA genes that come out to particular phylogenetic groups by building evolutionary trees, and then counting how many individuals map to particular phylogenetic groups to get an estimate of the abundance of organisms in the original sample. And what is shown here is a, a bar graph where the color 
corresponds to the relative abundance of a particular phylum of either bacteria or archaea. Uh, most of the things in these samples are bacteria. And the width of the, the bar here is the percentage out of 100 of the members of that group compared to other groups in the sample. And what um, you see here is if you look at all sorts of ecosystems from uh, inside insects and earthworms and then soils and various sediments, uh, human samples but not gut samples, so over here we'll get to in a minute are gut samples, so this is like skin and the mouth, um, saltwater samples, uh, etc., termite gut samples, you see an enormous amount of variation in the microbes that are found in different communities and in their relative abundance. As I've mentioned before, there are estimates of hundreds of different phyla of bacteria found in diverse environments on the planet. But if you look at gut samples from diverse vertebrates, you see that they are much more similar to each other than all these other samples are to each other or to the vertebrate gut. The vertebrate gut, on average, is dominated by representatives of two phyla of bacteria. The firmicutes, which we talked about a little bit, and we'll talk about again in a few minutes, and the bacteroidetes, one of the groups that we didn't really talk about. But this has been used as an indication that the, the gut is not just a collection of all the microbes that come into our system from the air and water and food and other sources. Our bodies are selecting in some way, uh, either by just the environment that's there or by interactions with the microbes that are coming in, selecting which microbes stay around and, and linger and survive and thrive in the gut. And um, if you treat these features, which I'm not going to show you, but if you treat these features as characters for character state reconstruction, um, we would infer that the common ancestor of all vertebrates had microbes in the gut. That's not that surprising. They were dominated by firmicutes and by bacteroidetes. And so that means that vertebrates have been co-evolving with these lineages of bacteria for hundreds of millions of years. And in that time, there has been ample time for the microbes to evolve ways to interact with the host and for the host to evolve ways to interact with the microbes that as we study them in more detail, we are discovering that these are incredibly elaborate, complex, highly developed interactions between vertebrates and the microbes that live in our gut. Um, if we go back to this tree, so what I was talking about here was reaching out in the tree or reaching back in the past to the common ancestor of all vertebrates. Um, one of the things that has happened as um, the technology for sampling the microbes has gotten cheaper and easier is the ability to look not just between species, but in much more detail within species. And as I mentioned in the last class, a lot of the focus on this in humans has been on health. What you know, microbes are found in people with particular um, diseases or particular health phenotypes. Um, but there's also been some work, in particular in the last few years, on variation just across different human populations, not specifically associated with health, but trying to understand what the ancestral microbiome was in ancestors of humans. And one of the reasons for that is that as we compare people with different health conditions, and as we identify that um, things like taking antibiotics or being born by C-section or excessive cleanliness disturb the microbial community in some way, it would be very helpful to know if when people get some problem like autoimmune diseases or allergy that might be related to the microbiome, if, if their microbial community has new microbes that have not been seen before in humans, that might indicate that those microbes are causing the negative effects. Or maybe they're missing microbes that are normally, or in the past, were there in humans and that might have beneficial effects and are now gone, and therefore it's the loss of those microbes that are causing some type of 
phenotypic effect. And so what a lot of researchers have now been doing is to go and sample diverse human populations. There have been a few studies of this. I just thought I would mention this one because it came out the day before yesterday. Um, and there have been a lot of news stories, blog posts. There's a really good blog post by a very good science writer, Ed Yong, um, who blogs at, uh, I think, um, Discovery Channel or National Geographic now. Um, and a bunch of news stories that were about this where researchers went to this... Um, uh, hunter-gatherer population in Tanzania called the Hadza worked with actually the people in this community, um, got information about their behaviors, their diets, some of their aspects of their lifestyle, and then um, you know got information about the environment in which they live. It's pretty isolated. They haven't been exposed, at least in large amounts, to modern antibiotics and modern um, sort of westernized food and other things, so it's thought that they're at least a good model for better understanding what um, the microbiome, how it might have been changed by certain sort of uh, human activities. And this is the same type of data that I showed you a minute ago for Ruth Lay's study, where they made a bar chart of the relative abundance of representatives of these different phyla, again with Isolating DNA, I think they used um, fecal samples here. Isolating DNA, running PCR, doing sequencing, building phylogenetic trees, and then counting the different organisms. Um, and what you see is they, they did a control. These controls are really important for these studies to try and take samples with the exactly the same protocols and characterize them. So they used a population of Italians as their control. And then here's the population of different members of the Hadza tribe. Um, and what you see is some pretty big differences in the what taxa are seen outside of the firmicutes in these um, individuals. So both of the populations, the Italians and the Hadza, have a high relative abundance of firmicutes. Um, both of them have reasonable amounts of bacteroidetes, although there is some difference in those. But if you look at the Hadza, they have a much higher relative abundance of a couple of phyla that are generally missing from the Italian population. These phyla include proteobacteria and spirochetes. It's not clear exactly what, um, uh, whether or not there are health effects of these differences, but it's this type of study that will give us the comparative data to help interpret studies of health differences and the effects of the microbiome on health. This figure on the bottom is just the same data, but they've plotted the relative abundance of genera like Bacillus or Escherichia rather than of phyla. And you're going to see a lot more studies like this. There are a bunch of studies where people are trying to get samples that are actually truly ancient samples. So these are not, of course, ancient samples. This is a modern human population. They are not completely isolated from the rest of the world. But people have gone and got, uh, obtained samples from like mummies and uh, burials in bogs and people who have been found when glaciers have thawed, the so-called ice men and ice women samples and looked at the microbiome in those samples. And we're getting a better and better picture of what is different today than in the past. And it seems pretty clear that there are lineages of microbes that are mostly gone today from modern human populations that were much more abundant in the past. Whether or not that's a good or a bad thing is unclear, but there's definitely major differences that have occurred over time. So from all of these microbiome studies, the ones of health and disease, the ones of ecology, the ones of evolution, um, and many previous studies that were done over the last 40 or 50 years, We've gotten a pretty decent picture of either what the microbiome can do for human biology and human health or what it seems likely to do or at least has potential to do. And this is a list of examples of what has been shown at least in a few papers, a few scientific studies that the microbiome is contributing to human biology. So we've known for many years, long before any of these DNA-based studies, um, that the microbes in our gut contribute to the digestion of food. 
and to the metabolism of many compounds like drugs. You take, ingest some pharmaceutical, the microbes in your gut actually will start to eat it and convert it into various other compounds and can have profound impact on um, differences between people in the metabolism of drugs. If you have a different microbial community from one person to another, it might affect what actually drug makes it into your bloodstream. The microbiome is definitely involved in regulating and managing the immune system. Uh, they can protect us from pathogenic infections. There's some, although not as good, evidence that the microbial community is at least indirectly involved in certain types of wound healing. Um, there's lots of correlative evidence, and I'll come back to what I mean by that in a second, that the microbiome in people is involved in metabolic rate and may be involved in things like obesity. If you remember the mouse example I talked about, it seems that parallels do exist in humans. Um, microbial community in our gut is involved in making various vitamins, and even in things like our appearance and our uh, odor, yes. Um, and there's just lots of evidence now that the cloud of microbes that don't really make us sick, per se, they don't cause disease, but they play a profound role in our um, biology and functions. They also, um, related to that, if you look at the collection of microbes that live in and on us and compare the content of their genomes, that is, the genetic potential that they have versus the genetic potential that we have in our genomes, so the human genome encodes something on the order of 30,000 different proteins, protein coding genes in the human genome. The microbes that live in your gut encode probably a million different proteins. And those can have profound impact on lots of aspects of our lives. And so one of the things that's being done now, rather than focusing on just documenting what kinds of microbes are living in and on us, Many people are now trying to read the entire genome content of the microbes that live in and on people and in and on other organisms. We're not going to talk about this here, but it's basically the same idea. You isolate DNA from an environmental sample, but instead of doing ribosomal RNA sequencing, you actually read the entire genomic content and try and infer from that what the functional potential is of a microbial community. The sort of last thing in terms of function that I'll mention is there are uh, many studies in the last few years that have been starting to point towards the potential that the commensal microbes, that is the ones that aren't sort of causing obvious disease, may be manipulating our behavior in a variety of ways. There's um, something known as the gut-brain axis in uh, nerve and hormone communication systems between the gut and brain. And given that the microbe, many microbes have been living in and on vertebrates for hundreds of millions of years. It wouldn't be surprising if many of them have evolved ways to manipulate the behavior of their host with things like controlling what we eat, how much we eat, um, and a variety of other behaviors to increase their fitness, sometimes at our expense. Um, so I, I, I just want to point out that um, when I mentioned this list of potential functions for the human microbiome, and you will see, if you pay attention to the press stories about it, there's a new story about some potential role of the human microbiome every couple of days. There's been recent ones about um, uh, the role of the microbiome possibly in causing bowel and colon cancer, and even in causing breast cancer. Most of these studies are what are called correlative studies. That is, they have two populations, say people with breast cancer, people without breast cancer. They compare the microbial communities in those people, and they're different. That doesn't mean that the microbial community caused the disease. All it means is that there is a correlation right now. It could be that the disease itself is altering the physiology of the person, and then that causes changes in the microbial community, not the other way around. So um, the functions that I listed here, most of these have actually gone beyond simple correlative studies to show a, a likely causal role of the microbial community in these functions. 
but most of the cases that are being claimed or done right now are these correlative um, associations and not necessarily a causative association. And if you're curious, I don't know, how many people here have had their genome typed by companies like 23andMe or any other? Has anybody done this? Well, you don't have to say if you have. But um, So uh, you may know that you can send in a DNA sample, you spit in a little tube, and a variety of personal genomics companies will read a portion of your genome and send you back a report about your ancestry and your potential genetic risks to a variety of phenotypes and or diseases. Um, and it costs something like $100 to do this. There are multiple companies that will do the same thing for your microbiome. If you're interested in getting it typed, for full disclosure, I'm an advisor of both of these uh, organizations. Um, there are many of them that will do it also for about $100. It's unclear if there's any medical value in doing this, um, but many people are doing it nevertheless. Um, uh, and you get back a report saying, what is the relative abundance of the different microbes in your system? All right, so that's, that's it for sort of the cloud of microbes that live in and on people. Are there any questions about that before we move into pathogens? Yeah. Yeah, it's a question about commensalism and mutualism. I've got slides on that right now, so let's talk about that right now. Um, so uh, formally, and the way we use it in the class, symbiosis is defined, and I've shown this before, as an intimate association between at least two organisms where at least one of those organisms benefits. So this is different from the way the term is used in um, many uh, other, um, in the public in many cases, or in even in other fields. In many cases, symbiosis is used to refer specifically to situations where both partners benefit that's what we call mutualism, and I'll come back to that in a second. So symbiosis, one partner benefits, and the other doesn't have to benefit. And endosymbiosis is just a form of symbiosis where one of the partners is living inside the cells of another partner. That was the organelle examples that we talked about, and there are a variety of other endosymbiotic examples that we will talk about throughout the rest of the course. So. We can divide up symbioses into these three different types, benefits to organism A, and then organism B. If it benefits organism B, it's called a mutualism. If there's no obvious effect on organism B, it's called a commensalism. And if there's a negative effect on organism B, it's called parasitism. And the human microbiome that we've talked about is largely categorized as commensalism, but that's not not really a very precise use of the term. Mostly the cloud of microbes that live on, in and on people, we just don't know who is benefiting from this interaction. We don't even know if even one of the organisms is benefiting in some of these cases. So um, it's probably, uh, I've probably used it as the question just asked, and it's probably inappropriate to use that term unless we specifically know that one of the organisms is benefiting and the other is not affected at all. Whereas mutualism, um, we will talk about examples, and I will show you some more in a, a couple of seconds, of cases where we think both partners benefit. So if we look at mutualistic associations, um, we will see many of them throughout the course in a variety of types of interactions. In terms of microbial diversity, there are hundreds of examples of cases where a multicellular eukaryote, largely, occasionally single-celled eukaryotes, um, but a lot of examples with multicellular eukaryotes where they have a mutualistic interaction with bacteria, where the bacteria provide some metabolic function, usually, that the eukaryotes don't have, and that um, the bacteria benefits from protection or from the host providing access to oxygen or carbon dioxide or other compounds and the bacteria makes something using its metabolic processes for the host or breaks something down for the host. 
So for example, there are many digestive mutualistic symbioses involving animals, um, where like in ruminants and in termites, where microbes are digesting cellulose and providing the digested cellulose, the simpler carbohydrates to the host in exchange for some protection from the host. Um, there's a cool example in the book of this light organ symbiosis involving these um, bobtail squid. Uh, it's a really interesting way that the squid provide counter lighting when they're swimming at night with the moonlight coming from above that would create a shadow below them. And they have symbiotic bacteria on, the, on their bottom side that glow, that provide counter lighting so you can't tell from the shadow when they're swimming around. Um, there are many photosynthetic symbioses. There are many chemosynthetic symbioses where a bacterium is used to fix carbon but via chemical energy rather than light energy. And we will, we will see many more examples of this. There are lots of ones involving plants. There are many involving animals and fungi and so on. Um, but what we're going to talk about for the rest of the class today is parasitism. And again, this is where one partner benefits and the other is negatively affected. And we're going to focus largely on a specific type of parasitism where the parasite is an infectious agent. That is, it can get transmitted from one host to another host. And in addition, it causes a disease. So there are many parasites that um, have a negative effect on some hosts because they secrete you know, some toxin, but they, all they do is they sort of make the host weaker and don't cause any sort of officially defined disease. We're going to focus on the ones that, that are infectious and cause some type of disease. We've seen, when I did the tour of uh, microbial diversity, um, many of the groups that I went through have examples within those groups of pathogens. So spirochetes and cause the, include the causative agent of syphilis and Lyme disease. Chlamydias, most of the chlamydias that have been studied are pathogens. The high GC gram positives include the causative agents of tuberculosis and leprosy. The low GC gram positives include the causative agents of anthrax, botulism, tetanus. The proteobacteria include the causative agents of cholera, typhoid, plague. Um, Many of the microbial eukaryotic groups that we went through include examples of pathogens, the apicomplexins like plasmodium. The cilia of this parent. Um, uh, I didn't talk about this, but um, one of, there's a ciliate that um, if you have fish tanks you may be familiar with. It causes the ick that grows on some of the fish. Um, really disgusting and as a ciliate pathogen. The oomycetes, many of them that have been characterized are pathogens. The diplomonads and parabasalids that have been studied are. The kinetoplastids include the causative agents of sleeping sickness, Chagas, Leishmaniasis, and so on, and so on. Um, now, if you look across all of the diversity that we went through, the three major groups on the tree of life, and we look within each of those groups, what we see is that there are a lot of bacteria that are pathogens, but it's a very small total percentage of all the known diversity of bacteria. And in fact, if you look at most of the lineages of bacteria, it's only a rare representative of that group that is a pathogen. And if you look at the microbial eukaryotes, you see a similar pattern. There are some lineages where most of the known members of those lineages are pathogens, but in most cases, it's the rare member of a group that's a pathogen rather than the majority. Um, that, um, if you overlay this, I'm not going to show you this, but if you overlay pathogenicity onto a phylogenetic tree of microbes, it's very clear that pathogenicity has evolved many, many, many separate times in different groups of microbes. And in fact, there are many very distinct mechanisms by which organisms are pathogenic. Very strangely, there are no archaea that are known to be pathogens of anything. There is, as far as I know, no good explanation for this observation. Hundreds of bacteria are pathogens from all throughout the bacterial tree. Dozens to hundreds of eukaryotes are pathogens, probably thousands. Um, but yet not a single archaea has been discovered to be a pathogen. If you figure this out, you will be famous, I swear. 
because um, the public is dying to know about Archaea. I mean, it's just... Um, so what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about a little more detail on pathogens and go through um, two or three case studies of uh, actual pathogens. And one of the things that's important to read about in the book um, and that I'll just very briefly talk about is this concept called Koch's postulates, which were basically established a little over 100 years ago as a way of determining um, through specific set of experiments whether or not a particular pathogen caused a disease. And um, this is sort of a, a list of things that you should go through to study a particular organism. And one that I'm going to talk about and that the book talks about in particular in chapter 26 is this example of um, stomach ulcers. So stomach ulcers for many years, this is a little hole in the stomach wall, uh, were attributed to stress. Um, if you had, it was called the stress ulcer syndrome, and there was lots of studies and claims about why stress caused ulcers and how if you limited the stress in your life, you would be less likely to get uh, ulcers. And over maybe 30 or 40 years, researchers started to question this assumption. If you looked at biopsies of stomach ulcers, uh, researchers in the, I think even back into the 1930s and 40s, observed uh, spiral-shaped bacterial um, bacteria in the samples where they took out for um, biopsies for stomach ulcers, and eventually these were attributed to a particular bacterial species, Helicobacter pylori, um, spiral-shaped bacteria. It's not a spirochete. It's one of the rare spiral-shaped members of the proteobacterial group. It was actually misclassified originally as a spirochete. And what's um, a bit deranged uh, and really cool about the story of Helicobacter pylori is one scientist in particular and a few of his colleagues, this guy Barry Marshall in Australia, became obsessed with the idea that Helicobacter pylori might actually be causing stomach ulcers rather than just being a symptom of stomach ulcers. So he tested Koch's postulates on himself. He grew up Helicobacter pylori from people with stomach ulcers. He ingested it. He got stomach ulcers. And then he cured himself of those ulcers with antibiotics. And so he went through these postulates and basically showed that the model of stress causing ulcers was incorrect and this revolutionized our understanding of the human stomach. Many people before this thought the human stomach was sterile, clearly is not, and also revolutionized our understanding not only of ulcers, but of many other um, human diseases. You know, it's a little wacky, right, to cause a disease in yourself just to prove um, a hypothesis. He won one of these shiny metal things. Um, <laughs> Uh, associated with this in 2005 with one of the other people that worked with this on him with him uh, it's a pretty amazing story um, and what the book has in uh, this figure and in a little bit of the text is it takes you through these four parts of the postulates and then how he showed that helicobacter pylori and stomach ulcers fit in with each of these components of the Koch's postulates and I'm not going to go into detail in that in lecture, but you should uh, look over this figure. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, few minutes is take you through two other case studies of um, human pathogenic interactions. And in particular, because this is in part a evolution course, is to talk about how evolutionary studies were instrumental in these particular case studies. So the first one involves Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax. It's a member of the Firmicutes, that is the low GC gram positives. One of the nasty things about anthrax is it forms these endospores that I talked about before. Those endospores are incredibly resistant to all sorts of assaults you can throw at them. It is unfortunately why many in um, the United States and a variety of other countries, including the old Soviet Union, developed Bacillus anthracis into a biological weapon. You can put it inside bombs, have the bomb, the spores inside bombs, 
when the bomb goes off, the heat and pressure from the bomb does not kill the spores. So it's a way of distributing uh, anthrax. It's um, also an animal pathogen. It's normally found in cattle and sheep and other organisms. It's only rarely a human uh, pathogen. Uh, anthrax has been worked on in research labs for many, many years, both um, originally just because it caused some human disease, but then eventually in biological weapons projects and then what were called biological defense projects to protect against the biological weapons. Most of these biological defense projects were run by the same exact people who developed anthrax to be a weapon. It's a great trick if you want to get funding for uh, your work. Um, and uh, what I'm going to tell you about is this story related to the anthrax attacks that happened just after September 11th, um, October uh, of 2001, uh, where letters were sent to a variety of locations, including the U.S. Senate building, a news group in Florida, and a few other places. The envelopes were filled with spores of Bacillus anthracis. Um, unfortunately, a few people got exposed to the anthrax when the letters were either opened or when they just were processed through ma the mail system. And I can't remember how many, but at least four or five people died. Uh, and then they had to clean up these facilities. It's very hard to kill anthrax, so it cost billions of dollars to clean up uh, some of these facilities and then to re-engineer the entire mail system in order to try and prevent this from happening again. When this happened, um, I was working at a research institute that studied uh, the genomes of different microbes, a place called Tiger. I'm wearing the shirt um, today in honor of this. Um, and this research institute was already working on sequencing the genome of Bacillus anthracis as part of a, a defense project. Um, and uh, after the, the, this happened, the FBI and the U.S. government came to our institute and said, can you help us with this investigation to try and figure out where the anthrax used in the letters came from? And so, oh, again, so there were many different sites that they collected samples of anthrax from. They grew the anthrax in a laboratory. Yeah. How do you kill anthrax? Uh, how do you kill anthrax? What they did for the Senate building was stream in basically, I think, ozone. They sealed off the entire building, and then for a couple of days, they pumped in highly reactive oxygen species into it that eventually can kill the anthrax spores, but it's very, very hard. Um, so what we were asked to do associated with the study was to help them figure out where the anthrax and the letters came from. And the answer comes from phylogenetic analysis, from evolutionary studies of anthrax. And um, fortunately, when we started this project, uh, a researcher named Paul Keim uh, at Northern Arizona University had been taking collections of anthrax and trying to build a big phylogenetic tree of all the different anthrax strains to know how they were related to each other. Um, originally, uh, he and other people had gone to anthrax and used the exact method that we've talked about, grow it in the laboratory. Fortunately, anthrax can be cultured. Extract DNA, do ribosomal RNA-PCR, sequence the ribosomal RNA genes, and then you get out a sequence of the anthrax gene. And if you build a tree, you see that Bacillus anthracis groups it with the firmicutes uh, and with other Bacillus species. If you do this from multiple strains of anthrax, three different strains, and you build an evolutionary tree, unfortunately, they are identical to each other for their ribosomal RNA sequences. So ribosomal RNA does not have enough variation to distinguish among very, very closely related strains of organisms like anthrax. So Paul Keim had to look for other regions of the genome that might evolve at a higher rate than ribosomal RNA genes. You don't have to worry about the detail on this slide. He found um, such a re regions of the genome that had lots of lot polymorphisms among anthrax strains, the diverse anthrax collection, they're called VNTRs, variable number of tandem repeats. Doesn't really matter but what the detail is, but he could type different anthrax strains, distinguish them from each other. After culturing them, he could sequence the regions of their genome and built this really nice evolutionary tree of all the different Bacillus anthracis strains. The FBI sent him a sample from the letters, and he showed that 
that particular anthrax grouped in this one particular part of the anthrax family tree. Um, this was a particular variety of anthrax called the AIM strain. That was both good and bad. Um, it turns out that the AIM strain is a particular variety of anthrax isolated originally from the dead cow in the 1980s and then used by all of the major research labs around the world that studied anthrax. So this meant that, that what was ever in the letter did not come from someone going out to the field and collecting a new sample of anthrax. It came from someone getting anthrax from a research facility or a researcher. And so what the FBI asked the institute that I worked at to do was the next phase, which was, it turns out that for this VNTR region of the genome that Paul Keim worked on, all of the different flavors of the AIM strain were identical. And what they wanted to do was to see, they had a written history of the AIM strain. And they knew that it was originally sent to a lab called Fort Detrick, which then sent it out to many different labs in the United States and a lab in the United Kingdom, and then again sent it out to many different places. And they hoped that maybe in the growth of this strain in different places, they accumulated a couple of different mutations in the genome that could be detected if you did, if you read the entire genome sequence of anthrax, which is about six million letters of DNA. And the institute that I worked at, that's what we did, was read uh, long DNA sequences, genomes of organisms. So colleagues of mine at that institute read the sequence of the genome of these different isolates of the AIM strain from different labs around the country and the world, built an evolutionary tree that included um, the isolate from the letters as well as different versions of the AIM strain and helped the FBI pinpoint which particular variety of the AIM strain the anthrax came from in these letters. Now, it turns out that doesn't solve the case for you because unfortunately, hundreds of people still had access to these particular varieties of anthrax, the AIM strain, but the phylogenetic analysis greatly narrowed the search for trying to figure out who sent these letters. Um, and just, uh, yeah, question. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Did, they, did they find out who did this? Um, I'll just address this and rather than going into the last story. Um, so there was a major, um, unfortunately, the FBI accused one person of being involved in the anthrax letters who was eventually exonerated, this guy Hatfield, who was kind of a creepy character who had been involved in like biological weapons attacks in Africa and had access to the strains, but then he was exonerated. And then they accused another person of this who was also exonerated. And then they finally accused the third person of this who, um, just after he was accused, committed suicide and had many indirect lines of evidence pointing to him as being involved in this case. But actually, the National Academy of Sciences of the United States had an investigation after this man committed suicide that concluded that there was not enough evidence for the FBI to have convicted this person. The FBI still thinks he did it, but it is unclear right now whether or not he was the only person involved. And we'll leave it at that.